want to do what it took to really connect with God. And as a nation, we can agree we are a wealthy, prosperous nation, correct? I'm not going to say that any one of us is a millionaire or anything, but the average American, I read this, this last week, the average American is 90 times richer than the average historical human being. We, we are very wealthy when you compare us to the rest of history and to the rest of the world. We are exceedingly wealthy. And we know this through our study of the Bible. We know we are not to be like the church of Laodicea. We are not to get comfortable in this world. We are not to look at our riches and, and forget about God. And sometimes that still happens, I'm afraid. But for, for just a second here, I want us to look at the first part of this verse. You say, I am rich, I have grown wealthy, and need of nothing. Instead of looking at this through a financial lens, Let's look at this from a spiritual lens. We as Adventists, we are very proud of the truth we have. Amen? It's, it's probably not good to be proud, but we have a lot of truth. We understand Bible prophecy. We have the spirit of prophecy. Um, any Bible question people have somewhere, we have the answers. Correct? What if this verse could be talking to us? What if the reason we're not... Uh, excuse me. What if the reason we are not receiving the Holy Spirit the way we should is because we don't see our need because we think the truth is a substitute for the Holy Spirit? What if all of our Bible knowledge, all of the truth that we possess as Adventists has taken the place and filled the hole that the Holy Spirit is supposed to have? <clears throat> the Bible tells us in Luke 11... 13, so if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So that verse gives you the answer right there, but what are we to do if we want to receive the Holy Spirit? If we don't want to be like Laodicea, not seeing our need, what do we do if we need or if we want to receive the Holy Spirit? Ask. Ask. That is correct. But is it just a simple ask and receive? No. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. And again, it'll be on the screen. We're looking at verses 18 through 21. And when Simon saw that through the laying on, laying on the, the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given... He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Simon's heart was not right with God. He desired the Holy Spirit for what he could gain from it. Clearly, asking alone is not enough. We can't just ask and respect and expect to receive if our hearts are not consecrated and sanctified, ready to receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and we got to do this for a sense of I'll get to in a minute why the disciples wanted it, but we can't do it for a selfish reason. We can't be seeking the Holy Spirit for what we can gain, what we can get out of it, a, a happy, fuzzy feeling or a, a feeling of closeness to God. I mean, feeling of closeness to God is a wonderful thing, but that is not why he sends the Holy Spirit. So I want us to take a look for a moment at what the disciples did right before they received the Holy Spirit. They were waiting for a few days, and they did some things, and in Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White paints a beautiful picture of what they were doing right before they received the Holy Spirit. And um, I don't expect all of you to have a copy of Acts of the Apostles with you, but I have it up here on the screen. We're just going to go ahead and read through this, and I encourage you to go back. This is chapter 4 of Acts of the Apostles, and it's, it's really good. I just have a couple quotes here, but if you have time later today, go back, read through it. It's a wonderful reminder. As the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. 
As they meditated upon his pure, holy life, speaking about Jesus, they felt that no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great, if only they could bear witness in their lives to the loveliness of Christ's character. Oh, that's beautiful. The disciples prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men and in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. Putting away all differences, all desire for supremacy, they came close together in Christian fellowship. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for their holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world, and they claimed the power that Christ promised. So, let's do a quick review here. The disciples, what was the first thing they did? Anyone remember? They humbled themselves, confessing their unbelief. I think that if we're all honest with ourselves, we will admit that there are times and areas of our lives where we don't have the belief we should. They meditated upon the pure life of Christ. They prayed not for themselves, but for the fitness to reach others. That's a wonderful prayer to pray that God will always answer, helping us to become more fit to reach people for him. And they put aside their differences and came together in Christian fellowship, focusing on what they had in common and not what they disagreed on. That is something that we all could definitely work on. Okay. So, in other words, looking through these things, I'm sorry, my PowerPoint is not working the way I'd like it to. Bear with me. So, in other words, to sum all this up, the disciples put themselves aside. They put their hopes, their dreams, their goals aside, and they dedicated their whole being to the work they were given to do. I mean, Peter was married. You think he had something he wanted to do with his life? Settle down with his wife? Raise a family? I'm sure he had some things he wanted to do, but he put all of that aside to work for Christ. He dedicated his whole life to reaching souls for Christ. I think that the greatest need of our church, and when I speak our church, I'm speaking of the world church, not necessarily just Adventist either, is the need of the Holy Spirit. We all look at the Bible and the prophetic truth we have, and we don't realize our need of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We kind of think of it as a little extra and not as a necessity. And because we don't see our need, we have taken our eyes off the prize. We have forgotten what our primary goal is supposed to be on this earth. Which brings me to the second big reason we may not be receiving the Holy Spirit. And I already said it, it's we have forgotten our purpose for being here. Sadly, I feel that we are greatly lacking the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives because we are too comfortable with things of this earth. And unfortunately, our hearts are set on this world. Because we don't see our need, we have sometimes focused on building our earthly kingdoms and have neglected building the heavenly kingdom. We have the truth. And sometimes we let it end there. We have taken our eyes off of Jesus. So how do we fix this? The answer is pretty simple. It's by refocusing our goals, taking our minds off of ourselves, off of our hopes and dreams and our goals, and dedicating our whole being to God and the work he is giving us to do. And by letting nothing get in our way. The work God has given us to do is the most important work that is ever to be done, and we need to be fully focused, fully invested in it. Ellen White says this in the testimonies. The church is asleep 
as to the work it might do if it would give up all for Christ. A true spirit of self-sacrifice would be an argument for the reality and power of the gospel, which the world could not misunderstand or gainsay, and abundant blessings would be poured upon the church. Now remember what the disciples did. They were not praying for themselves, but they were praying for a fitness to reach others. And I believe the motive matters here. It's not just praying for the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned earlier, praying for the Holy Spirit and receiving it for the blessings that we can receive for ourselves, but praying for the Holy Spirit for the blessings we can be and give to others. And the disciples, you can see when you read through the book of Acts, they cared very deeply for others, for other people. And the ones who had not heard the gospel yet, they were willing to give up everything just to preach the word of Jesus to them, to let them know about Jesus, people they didn't even know. They had a deep love for winning souls, and I believe that is something we need so desperately. The disciples prayed and spent time with God, confessing their sins, praying for God to fit them to win souls. And that's exactly what we need to do too. The answer to this is stop focusing on our earthly kingdom and turn our focus to Jesus and the building of his heavenly kingdom. And this is something that can only happen if we have a heart change, something that Jesus has to give us. We can't do it of ourselves, amen? You all know what you need to do. You hear it all the time, and this is going to sound a little cliche, but it's spending time with God. We need that time with God every morning to start our day, to start our day right. His relationship with us needs to come first before anything else. The more time we spend with him, the more we will become like him. You all have heard the story of Jesus praying in the garden right before the crucifixion, and the disciples, they fell asleep on him when Jesus was asking him to pray, correct? And I'm sure all of you, like myself, have looked at that story and say, oh, what was wrong with them? I never would have done something like that. Oh, those unbelieving disciples, if only they had been more connected with God. But what if I told you that quite possibly you have done that? I know I have done that. And I try to have my devotions with God in the morning, and sometimes sleep will get in the way. Hold on, I'm, my slideshow's messed up. Oh, well, we'll keep going. So, how many of you struggle to wake up in the morning? Anybody? I know I do. It's, it's really difficult. And sometimes, way too many times, I press that snooze button. Just an extra five, ten minutes of sleep. Oh, God will understand. I know I need to wake up early, but God will understand. And the, the really awful part about it for me is... I will pray the night before, God, wake me up early so I can spend the time I need to with you. And then I'll wake up about 4.30. I'm like, not this early. I'll, I'll wake up a little bit later. It'll be okay. And then, then I have the audacity when I'm getting up at 5.30, 6 o'clock. God, don't you want to spend time with me? Why didn't you wake me up? Oh, man, shame on me. When we choose t- sleep over time with Jesus, we're doing just what the disciples did. And when you choose sleep over God, you are not serving God, you are serving yourself, or maybe even a God of sleep, which actually exists. This is the Greek God of sleep, hypnos. I didn't even know one existed, but they they actually had a God dedicated to sleep. And when we are choosing our sleep, which is a good thing, sleep is healthy, amen? We all need our sleep, our eight hours, but... If we are choosing our sleep over our time with God, we're not serving God. We're serving someone else. And I'm not suggesting anyone here is actually worshiping a false God, but we're at the very least choosing ourself over God, which is a type of worship. And it's not just our morning devotions that are important. We should be studying everything out for ourselves. And I know during the height of COVID, everyone probably remembers this. Everybody was an expert, right? 
You go online, you get all those messages, everyone telling you the latest information they found out about COVID. That's, that's all Facebook was for a while, I think, is just COVID information. And it kind of made me realize when I was studying this out, why aren't we like that with God, which is a much better message than the message of COVID, amen? I mean, that's, that's a terrible message. <clears throat> Imagine what would take place if we started going everywhere and preaching about Jesus to everyone we met, everyone we saw, just like we did with COVID. We were texting people, oh, look what's happening now. Imagine if we were doing that with the gospel of Jesus. As I mentioned before, sometimes as Adventists, we have a view that we have all the truth. Oh, I don't need to do a real deep study of the Bible. Someone has already done it for me. We have all these different books. We have the spirit of prophecy. We have Bible commentaries. Every question we could possibly ask, there's an answer somewhere, probably on amazing facts. And we think, oh, I don't need to do a deep study of the Bible. And we have so many amazing resources. And they they are a real blessing, aren't they? All the resources that we have at our disposal. But there's no substitute for opening up the Bible for ourselves. And... Sometimes we'll say, oh, I just want to stick to those feel-good verses, the, the ones about God's love for us. And don't get me wrong, those are wonderful, but they're definitely not enough. We need to be digging deep. Sometimes people may say, oh, I trust the preacher. I don't need to deep dive for myself. But let me tell you, we need to be fact-checking our preachers. And what I mean by that is I, I don't mean that I'm suspicious that the preacher's preaching up at the that are, are not preaching the word of God, that they're trying to lie to us, but, or even that they might have gotten something wrong, but the truth is that there is an incredible blessing from opening the Bible for ourselves. When the preacher asks you to turn in your Bibles with me, he's not asking, you need to double check me because I don't trust myself. He's saying, I want you to have the same blessing I had when I first read this verse. You're probably going to find something that other people never find. <clears throat> it says in Psalms 34, verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And we cannot taste and see for ourselves unless we open the Bible for ourselves. All right. So I'm reminded of the story. My slides got all messed up. Sorry about that, but... I'm reminded of the story in the Bible of of Jacob when talking about our devotions and how we need to be seeking God. And you remember Jacob, he was wrestling with the angel, with God. And finally, the angel told him, let me go for it is daybreak. And Jake, what did Jacob say? I will not let you go until you bless me. And that is exactly how we need to be with seeking the Holy Spirit. We cannot let go until the Lord blesses, until the Holy Spirit is sent. This is something we need to be really passionate about, something that we need to have more than anything else. Recently at uh, where I work, Revelation of Love Ministries, we've been trying to get a good internet connection. And we, we have been struggling for quite a while with the one we have and Um, Elon Musk has his Starlink, but we're about a mile outside of its availability. And then we have fiber coming all through the area, but we're about a mile away from its availability. And it just didn't seem like any good options out there. So we we finally found, um, through one of those cell providers, a way to do it. And we got the equipment. They were very helpful with us, getting the equipment to us. And um, I start doing some tests around the property, finding the best place to put the equipment and I finally found it. It's not the ideal location for it, but it's the best to get a good signal. I hook everything up, and we're still getting pretty bad signal. And, and when I say bad, for those of you who have a, a reference, we were getting about like 0.1 upload speed. Our, our down was okay, but it wasn't great. And sometimes our down was non-existent. It just was not reliable at all. And I had hooked up an antenna to amplify the signal. I'd gotten on the maps, and I'd figured out exactly where to point it, and by all accounts, everything should have been working. I told David, actually, after a while, I'm like, you know, this is just 
it. This is the best we can do. There's nothing we can do about it. This is just how it's going to be. And we were both pretty discouraged. We're like, oh, man, what are we going to do? So I did a little bit of research, and one day it was just so bad. I had enough internet to do the research, but just about nothing else. And so I did a little research, and I discovered that, and and let me paint a picture, picture for you real quick. We got the little router thing. We got a cable going up to the antenna, and then the antenna goes to the tower. And I read on a few places that the cable is very, very important. And I had glanced at that before when ordering the equipment, but um, I didn't think much of it. I thought, oh, a cable's a cable. It's, they'll all work. They just want me to spend more money. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get the best I can for cheap. And unfortunately, I realized I had greatly cheaped out on the cable. I had greatly cheaped out on that vital piece of connection. And I ordered a new cable, a high-quality one, and instant service, really fast. And I forgot to mention, our internet was pretty much unusable. Whenever a storm would come through, there was, there was nothing, pretty much, whenever we had thunder, lightning. And this new thing with the new cable, the good, solid connection... It is blazing fast even during the storms, even during the worst of storms. And our relationship with God is the same way. If we choose to skimp out on devotions and personal study or even just spend a couple minutes, oh, five minutes, that, that'll be enough. You wouldn't do that to a, to a close friend, would you? You haven't seen a close friend for a while, spending time with him? You wouldn't say, oh, five minutes, okay, I gotta go, see ya. No, the connection with God the quality of it is just as important as doing it. And the more quality time we spend with Jesus, the more he is going to change us to have a character like his. He will live through us and in us. His thoughts will become our thoughts, and the way he views a soul will become the way we view a soul. We will be prepared to receive the Holy Spirit, and when you, and then, When that happens, you better be ready because something truly amazing is going to take place when God outpours the Holy Spirit on us. When we have a true encounter with Jesus, when we are truly experiencing him living in our lives via the Holy Spirit, there can be only one outcome. We are going to want to share him with everyone we meet. When we see Jesus for who he really is, realize what he has done for us, the result should be that no power on earth can make us be quiet. In Isaiah 62, verse 1, if you want to turn there, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. Show me, tell me by a show of hands out there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little story. Let's say that this coming Monday, Chambers Bank, right down the road from us, is going to be giving $100 cash to anybody who comes through the door. They have an unlimited supply. I don't know how they got it, but they have an unlimited supply, and they are going to give it to everyone, man, woman, child, doesn't matter the age. Are you going to keep that to yourself? I, I hope you wouldn't. I mean, like, I'm... I consider some of you friends. I hope you wouldn't keep that from me. (laughs) And, I mean, you'd get your whole family, wouldn't you? Every single one of them. You'd go down there, you'd march in, and you'd get your $100. You'd be telling people you're down at Plyler's. You'd be telling people at Jeremy's gas station. You'd be telling everyone that, hey, they're giving away free money. Wouldn't you? I sure hope so. But why don't we do that with something that is so much more glorious and valuable than a hundred measly dollars? I mean, the glories that Jesus has for us, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. It's going to be infinitely better than anything this world could offer. And we choose to keep it to ourselves so often. Why? Why would we want to do that? I know it's getting... Uh, getting a little bit late. Who's, who's getting hungry? Anybody? I'm always hungry. I, I love food, and I have my parents to thank for that. My mom's an amazing cook, and my dad taught me how to enjoy it. <laughs> and boy, do I enjoy food. 
especially Mexican food. That is, any Mexican food lovers out there? I mean, oh man, that's the best stuff. You, you go to that restaurant and they set the chips and salsa before you and usually it's pretty good. And you say to yourself, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to eat a few. I don't want to spoil my appetite. You all say that, right? None of you do it, do you? <laughs> you, you I'm, I'm not going to say how many, but you should have seen how many baskets of chips and salsa my dad and I can put away. Uh, <laughs> it's embarrassing. That's why I'm not going to say it. But we keep on going for these chips, even though we know something better is coming. We ordered our food. It's on its way. But we just keep on going after those delicious chips and salsa. Why do we focus so much on the things of this world when we know something better is coming? Why do we keep on building our earthly kingdom when there is a heavenly kingdom that's going to be infinitely better? And believe me, I know, it, it can be discouraging when we're waiting and waiting. People have been saying for years, oh, Jesus is coming very soon, and we can get really complacent and say, oh, people have been saying that for years. I don't need to be in a hurry. He'll, he'll come when he comes. And we all recite, oh, yes, Jesus is coming very soon. But are we living it out in our lives? Are we reaching people the way we need to be with the urgency that we need to have for the reality of his soon coming? One day he is going to come and we better be ready. And more importantly, we better be able to make a good account for how we spend our time here. Eventually, going back to the restaurant analogy, when we are eating those chips and salsa, we come to a point where we realize we're full. I, don't, I can't finish my plate. I can't uh, finish the burrito I ordered because I had too many chips and salsa. And that's what's going to happen to us if we take our eyes off the greatest prize and settle for something less than. We will always feel disappointed and not fully satisfied. We hear talk about the outpouring of the latter rain. We read stories, the early church, both in the Bible and during the Reformation, and the start of Adventism, where the church flourished and grew. And it was in such a way that you look at it and you're like, there is no way they were doing that on their own. That's the Holy Spirit working. And you may even hear stories today about churches around the country. I know I have where they are just flourishing and they are clearly, they're working with the power of the Holy Spirit. So I asked, how do we get to the point where we can experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the church? And I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do know where it starts. It starts with me and with you as individuals. Until we are individually overflowing with the Holy Spirit, God cannot send the Holy Spirit to overflow in our church. We have to do it individually first. Ellen White says in 8 Testimonies, Volume 8, it is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last harvest would be ripened and Christ would come together the precious grain. My brethren and sisters, plead for the Holy Spirit. God stands back of every promise he has made. With your Bibles in hand, say, I have done as thou hast said. I present thy promise. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Christ declares, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We have an evangelistic series coming up this fall, and we can't expect that to be a success. We can't expect for an amazing amount of people giving their hearts to God if we are doing this under our own power and in our own strength. We can't expect success if we don't have the Holy Spirit. And we have a great opportunity right now to stop trying to do things in our own strength, to stop thinking that our knowledge of the Bible will be enough. 
We have an opportunity to fully rely on God with this, and it all starts in our individual lives. We have a real chance here to ask God for the Holy Spirit in our lives, to earnestly seek him and to hold on to the promise like Jacob and not let go until we are filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to go home, our heavenly home, not the one down there. And I'm tired of this world. It's, it's, it's not that great. There's so much sin and sorrow and suffering, and I'm ready to go home. And I know that all of you share that goal. Let's start acting like it. Let's start acting like we really want to be in heaven. Let's ask the Holy Spirit in our lives today so that, as Sister White said, we can hasten the coming of our Lord. If this is your desire, please stand with me as we pray. And I want to say, don't pray this prayer unless you are truly ready for what God is going to do. Don't ask unless you are truly ready to receive. Because when God sends the Holy Spirit, we'd better hold on because the results are going to be unbelievable. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the Sabbath day, the bright, sunny sunshine that we have outside. Lord, I pray that you will give a deep desire to each and every person here to individually seek the Holy Spirit in their lives. I pray, Lord, that you will pour the Holy Spirit out over our church as a whole so that this event that we have coming up for the passing out of the great controversy books we will be doing, all the different things that we are going to be doing for outreach, that they will be a success that can only be explained by you working. I pray, Lord, that you will give us the strength and the courage to pray the prayer, to send the Holy Spirit into our lives. I know it can be a scary thing, Lord, the thought about going out. I am not a person who likes going out and knocking on doors, but Lord, through your strength, you can make me that. I pray, Lord, that you be with us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to have our closing hymn now, number 269, Come Out with the Holy Spirit. And while you're turning there, we'll just mention, um, we just had closing prayer there, so we won't have a prayer to follow this up. But when we're done, if you'd just silently go on out there and leave room for those who would like to pray for the Holy Spirit in here.
people who dismiss Islam. 